You're listening to Garibaldi Red, a Nottingham Forest podcast brought to you by Nottinghamshire Live. Hello, welcome to Garibaldi Red as Nottingham Forest find themselves in broad in an increasingly tight, increasingly tense relegation battle. The Reds are now just two points and four places above the bottom three, with five points separating 12th and 20th in the Premier League. Forest find themselves under ever more pressure after a 3 1 defeat to Tottenham the weekend. So, joining me to discuss the game and the bigger picture, first of all, is Reds legend Gary Bertels. Gary, good morning. Good that morning. shirt, that wallpaper, it's amazing. How are you? Uh, I'm very good, thank you. Are you? Yeah, good. <laughs> I that my morning scene you. <laughs> well, I mean, what are you wearing? You look, you look like a teenager with a hoodie on there. What, what I've got my hoodie on. I've got people think I've got one hoodie, but I've got a collection of about ten hoodies that are all the same. Uh, yeah. Don't slag off the picture behind me. My wife did that. So I just didn't to say warn that. you, put your foot in it. He who throws the first, he who throws the first stone buys lavender from true. the market. <laughs> Come on, get on. Second guest today is Red fan Greg Mitchell. Morning, Greg. How are you? Good. Feeling all right today. Yeah. Good, Re- good. Ready we'll to go. Your, we'll need your positivity, I think, as we go along. And third guest is Darren Fletcher. Fletch, good morning. You well? Very good. Thank you. Good, good. And we'll obviously need you as well. But we'll come to you first, Greg, because you were there at the weekend. Uh, you were pretty down on Saturday, I must admit, even for you coming away from the ground. I think people probably weren't surprised at all by Forrest losing, but the manner of the first half in particular left a bit of pill in the table in the mouth, didn't it? Yeah. And, you know, when you walk out of the ground, it don't matter who you've played. When you've lost, it's just gut-wrenching, isn't it? The whole, the whole day, the whole build-up, and then that happens, you think, bloody hell. But, uh, you know, a couple of days later, there's a, a lot more to talk about, a lot more to think about than that. And to be honest, coming out of the ground... Did we really go to expect to beat Spurs, one of the top 20 teams in Europe, aren't you? you know, Harry Kane up front, it's a bit of perspective and realise that this isn't the game that keeps us up or takes us down. But, you know, I'm all right now. Took a couple of days, I must admit. I think those games are coming now that will keep us up and they're getting closer. I suppose, Fletch, I mean, there's a lot of people who are worried, coming. you know, the, the state of the league table, the performance in the first half. How are you feeling about the, just the general state of play? We'll open it out a lot more as we go along, but is it is it nervy times for you? Yeah, it is. It, of course, it's nervy, but I mean, it's nervy for half the Premier League, if you look at it. Um, I, I can't recall a relegation battle that includes so many teams legitimately at this stage. I mean, you often look sometimes and say, there's two or three teams that might drop in. The reality is now they're all in it now for what seems like the long haul. And because there are so many teams in it, they're all going to be playing each other on a weekly basis. There's always going to be six pointers between teams down there. So it's going to be difficult for teams to drag themselves away from the situation they're in. But I would go back to right at the start of the season. I want to try and start with a bit of positivity because I will have a bit of negativity on the podcast today based on what I'm seeing at the moment. But Forrest have got 12 games to go. And Forrest are in a position now where if they get 10 points from the last 12 matches, they're probably going to stay in the Premier League. So they're right there. They're in a good position. The home form is still solid. Away, they've been poor all year, but nothing's really changed. I just think it's this this fear that the nearer you get to the end of the season and you're still in the fight, that people obviously panic. And there were issues at Tottenham. There were issues at West Ham. There were issues at home to Leeds and Everton, which we'll, we'll talk about today. But they are still in a strong position with regard to staying up if you look big picture as opposed to looking 90 minutes at Tottenham. So I am still positive, still got faith in the manager, faith in the squad. And I'm, I still adamantly believe that we're going to stay in the Premier League this season. What about you, Gary, before we get into more specific discussions? How are you feeling? Yeah, I agree with Fletch because you look at what what was the start of the season and where we are now. I don't think people expected any of that. You know, we're, we're, we're still, it's in our hands. That's the most important thing. But you've, you've got to start finding results from somewhere away from home or, you know, at home. You look at Bournemouth, the Liverpool game. At all. Nobody expected that. Everybody after the Man United thrashing expected Liverpool to win. Bournemouth found something. You know, Everton found something at the weekend. You know, they beat Brentford. A lot of people thought Brentford would go there and win the game. 
you know, so we've got to start finding, you know, I think games, I, I think we're, we're not doing the basics well enough at the moment. You look at the goals that we conceded against Tottenham. I said they were avoidable goals. The one that was disallowed in the first few minutes was just a long straight ball that did for us. You know, it's a fantastic finish, but it was a, just a, you know, a bread and butter ball that, you know, we should be dealing with. And then, you know, we're not doing the basics well defensively. I remember Brian Clough, we've said this before, stop the cross, stop the cross. He, sh- he yelled that, and if you didn't do it, and, and by doing, you know, you, you've got a right telling off afterwards and, and the rest. You've got to close down. You've got to stop that ball coming in your box. And now, I, I, the way defenders defend, especially at set pieces, they're not even looking at the ball when it comes in, you know, from a corner, and with the hands behind the back. How can you possibly defend anything when you've got your hands behind your back? You try it, and you're off balance. You've got no, you've got no choice, Gaz. You've Bump? got no choice. You've got no choice. You have to defend that way. You can't. The rules have been... Because the rules have been changed to the ball, ball. Ball. Yeah, but yeah, but it's, it's one goals and they want action and they're going to give penalties. If you stand there with your arms out like this, you're going to give a penalty away every week. You no, can't I don't mean like that. Games. I mean, just have it down beside, but not behind your back. You Gaz, can't have it behind your back. Yes, even when they're down by your sides, you've not got a great deal of flexibility to jump. I have this conversation so. with centre backs that I work with, and, and, and the game is now against them being able to do what you say. Because you're never going to get the benefit of the doubt. I was at Bournemouth at the weekend doing the game that you talked about. Adam Smith jumped in the air and he's up like this. And he's had to use his arms to jump. And he has to use his arms for protection. But because he doesn't get it down quick enough, he gets the penalties given. Now, people don't like it, but that's the way the game is officiated now. So a defender has to defend that way. Otherwise, they're going to concede penalties. And then they're going to get criticised for doing that. The rules have changed. They want more goals. They want more situations like that. I feel for defenders, but they've got no choice. We don't like it, but we have to right, accept then, it. Because in that respect, it why, why don't referees give penalties for all the holding and pulling and stopping it's, people because, moving in the box? Because they don't. But they're, because they don't. Because they've yeah. not got to that yet. But, but they are the giving thing. penalties. If they're not part of the game now, that should be part of the game now. They should give a penalty no, for it. But the, well, the, the handball is. So we beg to differ. Like right. <laughs> it begs to differ. That's fine. <laughs> Bring it back in. <laughs> I wanna... if you're not, that is the rule. <laughs> you know, I don't, I'm, I'm with you. I don't like it. But Brian would have had a nightmare when he was saying to your fullbacks or wingers to block the cross and they're trying to stand there like this. It's virtually impossible. Well, the, best, the best bet would be to uh, close them down outside the box so they didn't have to do it. But, you know, you defenders don't do that, do they? There you go. Um, We'll come on to penalties, obviously one involving Forrest. I just want to play this Steve Cooper clip, which probably informs a lot of the conversation about the game. So I'll play this and then I'll get you to take afterwards. What players play and formations you play, them things don't matter um, if you're not competing. And um, I didn't didn't like us in the duels, I didn't like us in the 1v1s, even things like tackling. You know, you look at it around, around the goals and... Um, um, it, it just wasn't at the competitive level that it needs to, to be. And, you know, if anything, the disallowed goal should have been the warning sign. So um, we just weren't aggressive enough in the first half. Right. It was a bit quiet. So I did turn the sound up on that as much as I, I can. I couldn't hear it at all. So. Well, that's all right. I won't ask you about it. <laughs> I'll ask Fletch about it. That's what worried me coming out of the end. I mean, for Gary, you couldn't hear. For Gary, benefit and people, if the sound's a bit quiet, I apologise. Steve Cooper there talking about not competing in the first half, losing battles, not seeing things that he likes. And and that's becoming a bit of a trend that worries me, Fletch, in away games and also in home games as well. I mean, we'll talk about midfield. I sound like a broken record record on this podcast, my gripes about midfield. But that is a bit troubling, isn't it, when a manager's talking about that? Yeah, and it's not the first time he said it. I go back to the Chelsea match, which seems a long, long time ago. And exactly that, that was exactly the sentiment when Steve spoke after. But the first half, they essentially gifted Chelsea the possession and had to come back in the game. And this is not just Tottenham away. This was West Ham away. And I think to a, an extent, Leeds and Everton at home as well. They, they do look passive and they don't look like they want to compete in that regard. And I think that has to come from within. And I think that if you allow Premier League players the time and space that Forrest are allowing them, particularly in the middle of the pitch and then Forrest's final third. Those players are good enough to generate chances and score goals. The same would apply if Forrest were given that kind of space at the other end. They've got players that would 
maximise the opportunity, generate chances and score goals. This has to come from within. I think they're looking bad. I mean, look, I'm not a coach. I, I look at it through a fan's eye. As everybody else does who's listening to this podcast, and I don't claim to know any, any more than anybody else, but when I look at that midfield, I think the best midfield performances that we've seen this season involve Czech Kiate, Ryan Yates, and one other. And it was about aggression. It was about running. It was about energy. And then when they'd won the ball back, they would give it to the playmakers and the team would make something happen. They'd make sure they got Morgan Gibbs White on the ball or whatever. I look at it now, it seems a competition between John Joe Shelby and Remo Froehler. Who can be deeper? You've got two that want to sit ridiculously deep. There's no energy in there. There's no legs in there. And all of these midfields that they're playing against have players with genuine energy who want to go box to box. They want to make tackles. I look at that group at the minute. And I think the only positive I would take from the midfield from recent matches was the period of time that Yates was on the pitch against Everton when he changed the game. He gave them that injection of something that was missing. He was Ryan Yates and they looked a different team. He could compete with Anana, compete with Decore, compete with, with Adrissa Garner game because he's that tight. But when you take him out, there's no mobility in there. Nobody wants to move. Nobody wants to run and join in. Oh, just work. I was just going to say, there's no mobility in that midfield. There wasn't against Everton until IU, Dennis and Yates came on. Then we looked like we could, you know, win the game without a doubt. And I think it was the same second half, wasn't it? You know, when they, they came on, there was more mobility, more pace, more, you know, causing defenders problems. And they scored against the run of play by all accounts. And that third goal was a dreadful one to concede again. It was so simple. It was ridiculous. Mm. Right, we'll come on to the goal specifically. I mean, Greg, from a fan's point of view, does it frustrate you to hear a manager talking about players? I don't know if it's not saying they're not putting their lot in or not trying hard enough, but whether they're lacking confidence or what. But it's tough to hear as a fan, is it? No, it was, I thought it was quite um, reassuring to hear that he sees it, what went wrong. And that, that first disallowed goal, the one where he said it was the warning sign, you can't really blame the midfield for that because it was an absolutely amazing ball straight from defence, straight over and Richarlison's a world-class player. So, yeah, I can see why that's a warning sign, but it kind of made you realise where we are. This is a team that's been put together straight up from the Championship and we're playing world-class players, so we can't be... <laughs> expected to to go and do it every week all right every so often it'd be nice away from home but for me when we're talking about the midfield coyote is now training again isn't he he's getting closer yates is on on the pitch so you know you've got a good defender coming back now finally on the bench it's like new signings it's like these new signings we're getting in march so if this was our bad run if fulham was it fulham man city West Ham, Everton uh, and Sunday, Saturday was our bad run and we got a couple of points from that. They might be the points that keep us up and from now on, you know, Newcastle on, when is it, Friday, winning gets us up to 12 with some new players coming out on the bench. It isn't all doom and gloom. I think we're all in danger of just getting dragged down into it, forgetting yeah. where we've come from, forgetting how hard it was to get here and how close we are to actually making it still a successful season. 12th Greg. by Friday, 12th by kickoff on Saturday. That'd be unbelievable at this time Greg, of the year. Interrupt a minute, please. Just on the, the fact about the Ricard Richarlison goal. When you're in uh, the Premier League, when you're in the Championship, when you're in the League One and League Two, you can afford to switch off in League Two, League One, and the Championship and get away with it on, you know, maybe 50% of the time, maybe at some point. But when you're in the Premier League, you switch off. At any point in that 90 minutes against the best teams, you're going to get found out. And that, Agree. in the first few minutes, that's what happened. I mean, you look at the Bournemouth against Arsenal the other <clears> week. <throat> they conceded after 11 seconds and they switched off. You know, they didn't expect that, that sort of onslaught from that first whistle. But you have to learn. It's a big learning curve when you play in the Premier League at the highest level. You, concentration is paramount. If you, if you don't concentrate for 90 minutes, if you do it for 89 you can still get in that one minute, you can still get done. And that's what happened with that first goal. You know, that's the difference in the Championship and the Premier League. I also mm. think as well, guys, that when you've got a midfield that wants to press a little bit higher, you've not got the kind of time to play the kind of balls that are getting in behind Forest either. I mean, people have looked at Liverpool a lot this season. 
and the problems that Trent Alexander-Arnold's had. That space has always been behind Trent Alexander-Arnold because that's the way he plays. But Liverpool's midfield used to be so aggressive that teams never really had the opportunity to play the pass. You then take 15%, 20% off Liverpool's midfield and there are lots of spaces to play into, hence why they're conceding more goals. And I think Greg's made the point there about, you know, we're up against Premier League teams and we've come from the Championship, and they're world-class class performers, etc. I would accept all of that, but then the manager can't be coming out and saying that it's a, an issue with competing. The minimum requirement for the Forest players, if they're going to stay up, is to compete. And some of them, because they don't have the ability of some of the world-class ones that you're talking about, need to be competing more. They need to be giving more energy, more work, because they've got to find the extra percentage in their game to level it off. I looked at Hoybier at the weekend. Now, Hoybier's not world-class, but he's a very good Premier League midfield player. But his work ethic is off the scale every time you see him. I don't think Oliver Skip had that amount of time in the Championship last season when he was at Norwich, whether it was last season or the season before. He had so much time to play. And it's dangerous. If you give players like that time and space in the Premier League, they will kill you. And I don't care who they are. Gary makes the point about Bournemouth. Liverpool were off it on Saturday. I did the game. Bournemouth were bottom of the table, but were, were, were eminently good enough to win that match. Mm. But win it in a way where, apart from the penalty, they weren't under too much duress. So th I think this is the strongest Premier League overall that we've ever had. Because there's no team in the league that's a whipping boy. There's no Norwich this year. They were conceding five every time they go out. Bournemouth at the bottom were able to beat a Liverpool team that put seven past Man United. So that shows you that the worst team in the league heading into the weekend was good enough to beat one of the best. So this is going to be the factor. Greg's making the point about Newcastle Friday. I commentated when they played against Manchester City. And if they'd have taken the chances that day, they'd have got something from that match. Callum Wilson had a nightmare, but they generated three or four really good opportunities at the Etihad. And yesterday, against Wolves, was as good as I've seen them. If Forrest get anything against Newcastle on Friday, it will be a fantastic result if Newcastle get back to that level. Because they are a top side. And this difficult run isn't over yet. And I know why the manager is making the, the statements that he is. Because he knows that his players have got to play to their absolute maximum effort if they're going to pick up points the rest of the way. And that has to be the minimum requirement for them. We've seen it this season. They had a run where they were fantastic. And, and we all, I think, got into the comfort zone of supporters saying they've done enough now, they'll be OK. I think the sentiment was, beat Everton and we'll stay up. It's too tight for that. And if you look at it now, the minimum requirement, game on game, the rest of the season for the last 12 matches, they've got to be at their absolute maximum in terms of effort, endeavour, because if you get that, then you're giving yourself a chance to win the football matches. If you don't, then you're taking a massive risk against some of these teams they're going to play. Yeah, true. I mean, I, on, on Skip, I thought he dominated that game, really. Uh, and Oliver Skip. Oliver Skip is a, is a tweener. He's, he's mm. half Championship, half Premier League. He looked like Xavi in the team at the well, weekend. If you give him that much space, he can do. That's what, There's your problem. But they're making... Forrest made Oliver Skip looked like a really good central midfield player in the Premier League at the weekend, and he's not. And i tell you what as well. I'll just give you this one briefly. What annoyed me more than anything is that it was feral inside that ground on Wednesday, the night they got knocked out by AC Milan. Conte's future was under, up for discussion. He wouldn't commit his future on Friday at the press conference. The players there at Tottenham, a lot of them look for a way out. If you give them a way out, they'll take it. They're not winners. It's why they get knocked out of competitions and don't win a trophy. I thought it was essential on Saturday for the Forest team to come out for the first 20 minutes and make it as uncomfortable as possible for that Tottenham group. Because I think one or two would have down tools. I think the crowd might have turned. And as passionate as Forest were, really, had lost to Wolves as well, Fletch. Yeah. 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 As, as passive as they were, they missed a the trick on Saturday to really put those Tottenham players under pressure. And I was, I, was, I was amazed that they didn't come out hell for leather for 20 minutes to really test the heart and minds of those Spurs players. Because I think they might have got a bit more out of it on Saturday had they been more aggressive from the off. Because that is a group that can, that can chuck in the towel relatively quickly. Because we've seen it. Um, let's talk about the goals that will lead us into players. If we start with the first goal, Gary, just get your take on it. I mean, you can talk about Harry Kane's movement. I thought we had it 
uh, you know, I thought he had a great game to be fair and exploited Forrest's weaknesses. But uh, John Joe Shelby's got to do a lot more there, hasn't he, is to start with to stop Richarlison? I go back to that word basics. If you don't do your basics well, you're going to get caught out. And basics are the things that, like you Fletch, Fletch just said, that are expected at that level, that you close down quickly, you win your challenges, you win your first ball in the air, whatever. You compete. If you don't compete and let world-class players like Harry Kane do what he did. I mean, look at the City ground, the 2-0. The he scored both their goals. We were probably the better side that day. You know, we created really good opportunities. We, we, we didn't have an out-and-out -out striker just to tap them in. Some great balls across the face of the goal. We get back in that game. We could have won that game because uh, I, I still think we were the better side. But at the, again, you, you have to talk about this level. In the championship, if you do that, you probably get away with it, you know, not closing down. But you don't when you come into the Premier League. And give Harry, Harry Kane time, space. He'll do what he does brilliantly. You know, make, he'll, he'll punish you. He'll make you suffer. Um, and that, that's, you know, he, can, he consistently does that. And we, like I say, the, all three goals were avoidable. We could have done a lot better with all three goals. Steve will know that. And he won't be happy with what he saw from his defender. You know, you defend from the front and maybe we didn't defend from the front well enough. You know, you can't just blame defenders all the time. You know, I when I played up front, I was told I've got to try and work across the line, close people down, try and stop them coming out from the back. And then the next line of defence is the midfield. You know, and sometimes maybe they're a little bit too deep. Uh, they let players with more ability, you know, run the game a little bit more. You know, do what you, what you your strengths are well. You know, it's like Clint Eastwood said in, in one of his films, good man always knows his limitations. Know your limitations. You know, and then play to, play to those. It, it, you can laugh, but it's true. Mm. Know that our players aren't as good as some of the, play, the Spurs players. But you have to do better <laughs> than we did for all three goals. Yeah. Guys, I could, you know, I, that's the third time I've ever been anywhere where Clint Eastwood's been quoted. I, if it was Churchill or it's perfect, John F. Kennedy, it, it was it was Bertieri, wasn't it? Clint Eastwood, we chose his limitations. So that's second goal. That's why we love you. That's brilliant, hey. Gary. You can talk us through the second goal as well, actually, before we come on to Joe Worrell. I mean, the second goal. Obviously, Joe's made a massive rick, and he, I'm sure he knows it as soon as he um, makes the tackle. You can see in his reaction, but also just in the build up to it. I mean, Harry Kane's kind of, he's not had to do a lot of running to get that space. You see, he's gone past Mangala and Shelby, who I'll be honest, I thought had really poor games, both of them off the ball. Uh, it's a collective failure, and obviously, Joe crowns it by that really poor tackle, doesn't he? Well, again, it's switching off. You know, midfield, if you, if you don't close down, you let your man go by you, you let him play past you, you're going to be in trouble. Joe will know exactly. I mean, the, I, I played centre-half. I never gave a penalty away when I played centre-half. So I was, you know, as a striker, you know what to do and you know what to try and go to centre-half into. And I was always told, stay on your feet, stay on your feet. Do not dive in. Just close down, stay on your feet. Joe, just, he dived in. You know, he thought he could get it. And defenders do that sometimes. You know, it's part and parcel of your job. Uh, but he got it wrong. And he knows he got it wrong. And... You know, Harry Kane is one of the best penalty takers in, in the business, although he missed one at the city ground. Mm. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's, it's about a learning curve. And if you don't learn from what happened last Saturday to the next game, that's when you start asking the big questions. Because if you don't learn, you don't deserve to be in the team. You have to put things right. You have to learn as a player. Steve Cooper can only put what he can put out there. He can't, you know, make a tackle. He can't close down. He asks his players to do that. And I've watched training, and I'll tell you what, it, it's so impression, uh, impressive watching them train. The closing down, you know, it, everything looks absolutely superb. The, the intensity, everything, you know, doesn't fail to impress you what Steve does on the training pitch. And then, you know, you see the players, you think, well, yeah, that's a, what a great session that is. You know, Steve's taken that. Hopefully the players take it on board, and obviously sometimes they don't. But the manager can do nothing about that. Um, Greg, I know you want to talk about Joe Wall. Uh, I, I stay, I, my phone died yesterday for hours and hours, and it Convenient. was great. And now it was good. I'm glad it did. It was nice not to be on <coughs> and not see any of what was being said, actually, to be honest. Um, it was go on, give, give us your take on Joe Wall and his weekend because he went on a bit of a Twitter blocking spree. For oh, I am, um, 
I like what Gary said to start with about knowing your limitations because Jay Worrell's up against one of the best strikers in the world. In world football, like bar one or two people, Harry Kane is right up there. So, yeah, if you had all the money in the world, you probably wouldn't have Jay Worrell in your back four up against Harry Kane. But we do. He's our club captain. He wears his heart on his sleeve. He knows absolutely everything about this football club and he loves it. You think he made that mistake on purpose? I bet he hasn't slept since he did it. And then he gets the abuse online. And, you know, to be honest, he weren't the worst player on that pitch. He made a stupid mistake and it cost a goal. He also did a brilliant block in the, all right, it was in the lead up to the third goal, but it was a superb block. He then scores a goal. I wish he'd have took the penalty. Might, that might have shut a couple more other people up. But it's so frustrating because this is our team. You can't hound a defender out and hope he doesn't play next week when you haven't got anyone else currently who's able to come in. You've got to get behind him. And I know it's hard. And I know when we've been out all day on the Saturday and you have a bit of a rant, you're probably not thinking fully. But I hope some of them are thinking, actually, I was a bit out of order. You know, that's, that's the guy who got us promoted. That's the guy who lifted the trophy at Wembley. And we're there just slagging him off online. It's just like... Well, it's I like... Know, like where isn't it at Man United? You know, you know, yeah, it's just tiring and it doesn't help. We've got such a massive run now. Such a, I, I always think back to Everton last year, what their fans did to keep them up for the last 10 games at home or whatever. Every Pack the ground out, pack the streets out, greeted them in, got behind them. I don't think they're going to do that this year. I think they've run out of time a little bit with that team. And it's our opportunity to show that we can be a little bit different, just like the owner was keeping hold of Cooper in October when we thought he was going to go, maybe the fans this time decide, actually, let's just get behind him. Let's do everything we can because they're going to need us. And that bloke's only human. That bloke's gone home on Saturday after a miserable day and read all that crap. And you think, bloody hell, like, come on, just have, <laughs> have a word. Everyone's entitled to their opinion. But don't be proudly putting up on Twitter, oh, I've been blocked by Joe Worrell, your club captain. What, are, you, are you a fan or not? Or are you happy just to like just to annoy your own players? So Greg, why, I just think Greg, I just think why you know. why are we talking about this? Why are we giving because he's seen it because why he's seen it and he these idiots. What are we doing here? Yeah. I mean, come on. I mean, listen. He's playing at the highest level in our game, and he's got to that level because he's mentally strong, and he's come through an academy system in in Nottingham that's made him mentally strong. He's the club captain because he's mentally strong. Do you think he's going to let these idiots bother him? Because he won't. Because he's made a sterner stuff. Because he's a better man than that. And that's why he's the captain. And that's why he'll come through. And, and the same people that were slaughtering him for giving the penalty away at the weekend, were they, say, were they saying how well he dug in against Everton next to Felipe to help the team get a point the week before when they are under the cosh? And they were under the cosh because he was one of the better players that day. And he stood out that day. And had it not been for him, they wouldn't have got the point. And all the way through this season, players have had good days and players have had bad days. And that's what happens when you're a newly promoted team and you're learning on the job. We've got great supporters and the majority of the fan base are fantastic. But the people who are doing this, if they think they're helping in any way, shape or form, they're not. They're just not doing any good. And if they lose Joe, which I'm telling you now they won't because he's mentally strong. But if they did, if they target somebody else in the group at some other stage, you lose that individual. And then you need them. And they're not really there mentally because you've beaten them down over the course of the season. And the team gets relegated. Well done. Well done. Thanks for helping. Because this is not a time where you should be kicking people in the ball. This is a time when the fan base should be coming together, having a look at what it is, realising that there may be 10 points away from staying in the Premier League, which would be the greatest achievement the club's had for decades, by the way. Why don't we realise and come together that we can all play a part? All play a part. The players will do their bit. The manager will do his bit. Coaching staff will do their bit. The fan base has to do its bit. And when this fan base is together, it's the best fan base in the country. But the people who are doing this right now will only have a detrimental effect on what this season turns out to be. Joe is Nottingham Forest through and through. He was born in our city. He cares passionately about the job that he does. He takes his job extremely seriously. He's extremely well respected by the manager and the players within the dressing room. And he gives the club everything he has, season upon season, game upon game. 
And yes, he gave a penalty away at the weekend. I've just seen the third goal here, where he makes a magnificent clearance. And then after that, Aurier and Shelby can both do significantly better. But I don't see those two getting battered for the third goal. I see Joe getting battered for the penalty. It's not fair. It's not nice. It's only going to do damage. And I would say to the people who are doing it, please stop, because I'm a Forest supporter, and I'd like to see my team in the Premier League next season, and I'd like to be a positive influence on that process. If you want to be a negative influence on that process, please keep your thoughts to yourself, because you're really not helping, and you might just balls it up for the rest of us. I think the other thing is, as well, he's under enough pressure now, because you've got Nia Carty on the bench. You've got a defender. All right, he's only played two. Talk to me about Nia Carty. Talk to me about Nia Carty. Well, I know he's only played two all games. Sudden, hang on. All of a sudden, he's the great host. Well, we got Nia Carty. Well, he is, is, though, isn't he? Have you ever one of them... Hang on. Have you ever known it take this long to get over a hamstring injury? Yeah, has well, there's probably thought, it's been complication. Has anybody, has anybody thought, thought that he might not have helped himself in that process and that we might have had him back earlier had he followed the protocols a little bit better? But the club's not the kind of club that throw people out to dry. So we might have had that player sooner if he maybe would have been listening to the medical staff at the club a little bit more. So now we're waiting for a player that possibly could have been back earlier, but it's not his fault that we're in the mess. It's Joe Worrell. He's been no. there all season, looked after himself and done his job to the best of his ability. Dougie Friedman said to me once, I'm a better player, Fletch, when I'm not in the team. Because he used to get battered when he was on the pitch at Forest, and whenever he was on the bench, everybody wanted him on the pitch. And this is just the nature of football as it is. And I think, <laughs> it's had enough. You know, but what I'd say it, to that it, is, it, it doesn't do any good to anyone. And we can't pick other individuals out and say, "Oh, we'll be all right when he's okay." The ones there now, in the main, are doing their bit. The ones that aren't there and haven't been there for a long time have been no use to us, really. No impact whatsoever from Nia Carty. So he might be great, he might not, but nobody knows. It's no good saying, well, get him back and get Warren, that will be OK. Nobody knows the answer to that. But there is hope on the bench, what I'm saying. For the last month, there hasn't been a defender on the bench. We've got one back all of a sudden. We've got Yates in the middle. So there is that. And it's going to make those players playing currently thinking, I'm not as secure week in, week out anyway. So we've got to have that, and it's better. Yeah, it's we're not, a better team with them Greg, on the bench. Greg, they're not sat there saying, "I better play better now." Near Catty's on the bench. They're playing as well as they can, whether he's there or not. The competition's healthy, though. If you've got a stronger bench, you've got a stronger starting eleven. That's that's not fair on the lads who've been playing. They're not going to start playing better now because Near Catty's on the bench. They're giving everything they've got, game on game. That's the, if you're a good professional, Gas, that's what you do. Of course, you do. Without a doubt. Uh, it, it's the basic requirement. Uh, my Wi-Fi has been an absolute uh, nightmare. You walk so. about, yeah. Yeah, I know, I know. I almost walked to my neighbour's house again, but it looks like it's come back. So I might do that. Um, I don't think I missed much there. Oh, you did. You did <laughs> I know, I know. Goodness me. <laughs> this, really bothers third me. Goal, Gary. this really bothers me because it can have such a destabilising effect on what everybody's trying to do. That everybody's a better manager than Steve all of a sudden. Everybody's a better centre-half than Joe Warren all of a sudden. Everybody's, there are fundamental issues within the team that he's quite sensible to talk about. The midfield is passive. The midfield is too deep. As Steve said at the weekend, they're not competing to the level they should. But to then isolate individuals and go, it's you. It's him. It's that one. And I'm going to go onto social media. I'm going to make his life an absolute misery. I mean, come on. Do yourself a favour. Just as a fella, at least have the courage to go and tell him yourself. Don't go behind a keyboard and be the bravest man in the room. Go and find him and tell him. Don't Thanks. sit there on a keyboard, giving it large, thinking you're the main man out there, and then bragging because the forest captain blocks you. I mean, if that's where your life is, come on. Do yourself a, I'll take you out for a night out and try and cheer you up if that's where you are. Because, I mean, that's ridiculous. That'd be a first. <laughs> <laughs> Gary, um, talk to us about the third goal. You mentioned it there, and Fletch mentioned it. Again, it's not. It's entirely avoidable, isn't it? I, it's, you know, lots of space. Shelby and Aurier can do a lot better, can't they? Well, ma masses of space. But the, the the worst thing was, Fletch, Fletch touched upon it there. Joe did magnificently there. He threw himself at that to block that to stop it coming in the box. 
he did his job, then he's done his job and he's down, he, he slid in to do it, so he could do no more, then his teammates around him should think, right, OK, yeah, that's fantastic. I'm going to close down. I'm going to do my job now. But did anybody close down? Did anybody stop the ball coming in the box? Did anybody stop Son, you know, from easily just stroking it into the back of that? No, they didn't. There was no reaction after Joe's tremendous challenge. There has to be reaction. You know, you've got to be proactive. You know, and nobody was. You know, in that situation, you've seen the space and time that he had on the right-hand side. You've seen your teammate put his, you know, his whole body on the line to stop it coming in the box. Then you automatically should be doing something to alleviate what's coming next. And nobody did. Everybody said it was statuesque. You know, nobody stopped anything happening. And it was so easy for Son just to put the ball in the back of the net. Mm. And, and that's disappointing as well. All three avoidable goals. And Steve, you know, he must be pulling his hair out because... It's down to base. I use that word all the time because if you haven't got that as a player, you're not going to be a player. It's all right having flashes of genius. You're all right if you're Messi or Ronaldo at that level who can get away with it because they've got players in their teams that will do the rest. But, you know, not everybody's got that facility. And, you know, not to react to something that Joe did there was, as a defender, it's unforgivable for me. I also think as well that this is a big confidence issue. When you look at the group at the minute, they don't look confident. They don't, they don't start games confidently. It's as though they need something to happen for them to, to get that confidence back in. And I think we saw it, didn't we, earlier in the season. They made a start that meant they couldn't gather any confidence. And then they got the victory against Tottenham, felt better about themselves, followed it up, got on a bit of a roll. And then you think how they were playing. You think, well, OK, they've got it, they've got it cracked. The confidence can go quite quickly too. And then you're looking for people within your group to just drag you through the worrying times. And the teams towards the top always seem to find those players. Players who can turn an average performance into a performance that you get something out and you stop that big confidence loss. I look at this group at the minute and they don't strike me as being a confident group. And I think that's that's testament to the results that we're seeing at the moment. You know, the win against Leeds... That could have been a turning point for them because they, they got a result on a day they didn't play particularly well. You'd probably say the same about Everton. But those two away matches at West Ham and Tottenham are damaging. And they've got to somehow drag themselves back now to feeling like they felt when they were putting that run together that got them out of the relegation zone. So I think the next the next two or three weeks is going to be vital for them because it could go one way or the other. You know, this, 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 this dip they're in at the moment can become a trough. If you can start to get out the other side of it, then... As we said right at the top of the podcast, they don't need a, a great deal of points. Three wins and a couple of bits and bobs, they should be OK. You look at that league this year and say that you don't stay up with 36, 37 points, you'd be unlucky because so many teams are taking points off everybody else. So I don't think they're that far away from it, but it's a long way away from it when, you, when you're playing without any confidence. And at the minute, they just don't look to me, to the eye, as a very confident group. Well, one and, win takes the pressure right off you, doesn't it? The, the, yeah. Palace, us, you know, Everton have crept up Wolves. You know, if they get one win, the pressure lifts massively because the gap becomes so much bigger and that puts pressure on the teams at the bottom. You know, Southampton, they'll be kicking themselves that they couldn't get anything at Manchester United playing against them. You know, Casemiro, their best player, sent off after 30-odd minutes. You know, they'll be kicking themselves thinking that's what a great opportunity that was for three points. Um, but, you know, that's the way it's going. It's going to get nervy, you know. That that level, you still feel the nerves. If you're under pressure, it gets difficult. But one win can alleviate that pressure without a doubt. Fletch talked about confidence there, Greg. I mean, perhaps I don't know if confidence is the problem with um, Jesse Lingard, but uh, he looks like a player who it's just not happening for him, is it? I, I don't know if this is the end for him as a starter because we'll come on to Brennan's injury and Chris Wood's injury. But uh, again, a really frustrating day for Lingard, wasn't it? Yeah, he's going to be given another chance just because of the amount of injuries, like you say, more than anything. But he's another player that's heavily affected by, you know, off the pitch issues. We've seen his documentary on Channel 4 and stuff. So I suppose you've got to be careful, but he's going to be so disappointed with how his season's gone with Forrest. And beyond his control, some of it, the injuries coming back and getting injured before Man U away, that was just a stinker of bad luck. But yeah, he didn't really have a good game on Saturday but like I've discussed nobody really did it's against Spurs for God's sakes so if he gets another chance on Friday night because we may well need him just because of the lack of options more than anything he might do what he did against Spurs 
uh, mm. back in whenever it was, and and actually show us that he's got that performance in there because you don't just suddenly become rubbish and never perform again. He might be going through a dip. There might be other things going off that we're not aware of. But yeah, I don't think you should give up on him yet. It just didn't happen for him again on Saturday. Let's put it into perspective as well. We've not been beaten at home since September. You know, and that's a massive reason why we're where we are in the league at the moment. And yeah, Newcastle, they are a very good side. When we played beat Liverpool, Liverpool were playing well at that particular point. You know, we got a point off Chelsea, we've got a point off Man City at home. You know, we've we've played against the big teams and we've not got beaten by them at home. So don't go out thinking if you go out with fear and you, you you're afraid of what's in front of you, LR Newcastle, then you're on a losing foot straight away. You've got to go out and be proactive get on the front foot from the start and just say, right, we're better than you. We respect you. That's what we were always told. Liverpool were the best team in the world when we you know, beat them in the European Cup and everything. And we were told, yeah, respect them, but don't be afraid of them. Go out. You know, I, I believe in you. And you know, that's, that's what you need as a player, to have that freedom to go out and express yourself and do the best you can do individually and within the team. And when we've done that at home, people don't like coming to the city ground. They don't like playing for us. Because it's a cauldron, you know, it really is. The noise levels in there. Still, every game, mate, the hairs on the back of your neck stand up. And the, the worst we've started a game, I think, was against Everton. You know, that was a, a shocking start to that particular game. Again, it was an avoidable goal. You know, the penalty was an avoidable goal. And I think that's the worrying thing at the moment. A lot of them have been avoidable goals. I can't think of one worldie that's gone in the top, you know, top corner or somebody's beat three or four players and stuck it in the net. They've all been comfortable, easy sort of goals that we've given opposition. You can cut those out, those mistakes, then you've got half a chance. But if you don't, you're going to put yourselves under pressure because you keep conceding in the wrong way. Mm. I also think on the Lingard situation, it's, it's difficult at the moment in the circumstances. Because the midfield is what it is, to then play with two players that want to play in a similar way in Gibbs, White and Lingard in the same group, because out of possession, we've got a problem. Jesse's mm -hmm. legs, since he got the hamstring, he's not looked as energetic as he was looking in the Tottenham match. And certainly as energetic as we've seen him when he's played for England and Manchester United and West Ham. I mean, he's a, he's a runner. But I look at whether he's got confidence in his own body at the minute, I would doubt. Um, maybe it's lingering a little bit. And I just think at the minute, Steve's just... Because he's not got Kiate and Yates, it gives him a real problem throughout the team. Because they're the two, the only two in the squad, in the centre of the pitch, that can match the Premier League players that they're up against for energy and, and industry. Whoever else you put in there, you're always a fraction off. And that's not being disrespectful to John Joe or Remo or anybody else. They are a certain type of player. And Freuler was more effective in a midfield that included Kiate and Yates. That suited him better. But when you start to take those people out, it's a problem. You can see why they were trying to recruit Onana in the summer. He went to Everton. They were linked with Lerma at Bournemouth. You know, players who can get around the pitch. It's why they bought Danilo in January, who, in the manager's opinion, hasn't settled down significantly yet, so he's not in the team. But th those kind of players are the ones that give you the legs and the energy in midfield. And you take that out. It's a difficult division to play in when you've not got that kind of industry in the middle of the park. And I think, I think it's having a... A knock-on effect for everybody else in the team. It's putting more pressure on the centre-back because any centre-back will tell you that they're only as good as the midfield in front of them. It's putting more pressure on, on strikers who've got to drop in and help out. And it also means that they're not getting Morgan Gibbs-White on the ball in the areas that he wants to get on the ball because they're not turning the possession over in the middle third because there's not enough work in there. So I think getting those two players back, Kiyate and Yates, and being able to start with them, I think it'll make a marked difference to the team. Forget other, other people who one or two might be having a pop at. I think those two are absolutely fundamental to when this Forest team functions at its best. But the sooner they come back, the better. And I also think, I didn't think I'd say this because I thought he might need a season to, to win everybody over. But Awani out there on the left-hand side and the running that he does, you think of the energy that's gone out the Forest team. Awani's a runner. Piatti's a runner. Yates is all over the pitch. It's a different team to play against when they're on the pitch. And I think they're paying the penalty at the minute for not having those individuals available because I think the team functions better when they're all there. Yeah. I think the thing well, is, I... well, he's, he's probably, Steve probably desperate to bring Ryan Yates back in yeah. and start him. But 
obviously because of the time he was out, he, he wants to protect him as well, which is understandable. And, you know, with the injury problems we've got at the moment, you know, he's, he's got to be maybe just a little bit more careful with him. He doesn't want to lose him as well, bring him back too quick because of the nature of the player he is. He's 100%. He, you know, he goes into challenges. You don't want him pulling up again because uh, you don't want to be losing him till the end of the season. So it's a difficult one for him with all the injury problems he's had, Steve. True, true. Uh, yeah, I thought like uh, Gibbs White didn't have his best game as well, to be fair. I think he, he looked frustrated and he, I mean, Mikey and our WhatsApp group questions if he's fully fit and he's just been playing within himself. I do wonder about that. There's so much you on him. Is, though, Matt, you know, when you think about the makeup of the team, you, when you've got those players with legs in the middle of the pitch, when you do get the ball, somebody's going to run and join in. When you think about the midfield at the moment, who goes to join in? Who, which, in the, which in the Forest team makes a run past one of the forward players to get your numbers in the box? Those forward players, when they get the ball at the minute, whether it's Brennan or, or Morgan or whatever it is, seem to be up there and are really, relatively isolated. A lot of the attacks you see at the minute, particularly away from home, it's Morgan Gibbs-White and Brennan Johnson against about five. And you're thinking you're going to score goals. But when Forrest have got that energy in the middle of the pitch, you'll get a Ryan Yates running into the box. It makes it more difficult because you've got more numbers in there. You're more mobile in the middle of the pitch. And I think it, it has a knock-on effect of everyone. You know, we're looking at Morgan and said, oh, I didn't maybe have his best game. No, but he also didn't have the kind of support that it, he needs when he's playing well. And he doesn't have the energy around him. So I think it, I guess that's the point I make, that it affects everyone when you lose that. And I think when, you, when they look at recruitment in the summer, if they stay in the Premier League, I think they'll try and ensure next season that they've got enough in that area of the pitch that, that they don't get themselves in the situation that they're in now. They'll hope that Danilo can, can kick on after a pre-season. And, and I think they'll... they'll it, it, I'd be surprised if they didn't go and try and get a top-notch modern central midfield player that can go box to box so you can build a team around. Because it looks to me as though that's what they they really need. I mean, people talk about Bruno Gimaraes at Newcastle. You take Joel Linton away from him and he finds it harder because he does that. There's a lot of players that do it and Forrest at the minute have got their two that they rely on out for an extended mm. period of time and that's a problem. Fletch, do you think Scarper would be better, you know, in the team, you know, instead of one of the ones you just mentioned who are, you know, but as mobile as him and not as gifted as him. Gaz, he certainly looks to me like he's a player that can make something happen. He'll have a shot on goal and he's got a lot of confidence about him. Um, I I'm surprised. I'm surprised that he's not involved in some way, shape or form if Jesse is. Mm. That, that's Yeah. That, that's 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 the one for me. He can even bring him on and he'll make something happen. In an yes. He can do that. He's a one player you look at and think, my word, yeah. we've said it. When we've seen him this season, you know, he's got a great range of passing. He's got great vision. And sometimes, you know, bringing him on for the last 15, 20 minutes might just be, you know, what, yeah. what we at some point. All I'd yeah. say, though, Gaz, and I always say this, that as fans, we get a window into what the club's doing for 90 minutes on a Saturday afternoon. And we don't know what happens from Sunday to Friday night that makes the manager make the decision that he makes. And maybe he sees things on the training pitch that doesn't fill him with confidence. We as supporters see the clips of Scarpa and say, well, he can score that kind of goal in Brazil. Maybe the manager and the coaching staff aren't seeing evidence of that since he's been over. So I would always put that caveat in. But they just look like a team at the minute that need as many match winners as they can possibly have available to the manager. So the fact he's yeah. not involved at all, if he's not injured, surprises me a little bit. I think, <clears throat> I have to check this, I think his wife might have just had a baby, so yeah, or she was heavily pregnant. There's always, like, might be personal. Well, exactly. Congratulations, we, we, wish, we wish the scar. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He, he didn't, he didn't have it, though, did he? So it'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, goes back, it goes back to your Dougie Freeman comments about and being better when they're off the pitch. And I don't know, yeah. I mean, it's getting on, obviously, but... We're going on about players and stuff. There's a very good chance Wood and Johnson are unfit. One or one of both or both of them are going to be unfit for Friday. So, like, where's Surridge? Like, is Surridge going to be ready to come back? Like, because he has got that quality to score the odd goal if needed. And we haven't and seen much of him the last few weeks. Great. I don't know whether you know this because you monitor social media a lot more than me. The, the people that were saying Brandon Johnson wasn't good enough for the Premier League, are they still posting at the minute? No. <laughs> I think there is profile picture. I think he's their profile. They've stopped, have they? 
Yeah. Right. I just wondered because that, that was a common theme early in the season. Johnson's not good enough for the Premier League. I wondered if they were still doing that or whether they changed their mind. Um, Gary, give us a word on Surridge. You're a big fan of his. I think he's got a lot of energy, but I don't know what's going on. He's out of favour, isn't he? Because Cooper have to go. You don't go cap in yeah. hand as a manager, but just go back to him. A bit low at the moment. So if I, if I fade out, you just have to accept it, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> okay. fully, fully loaded. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I like him because the honesty he gives you when he's out there, he'll back into people, he'll go into the channels, he'll close down, he'll run across the line, he'll make things difficult for defenders. And you can say what you like about finishing. When last season in the, uh, the championship, you still have to finish with the quality he finished with. And he finished some of those goals he scored brilliantly. They were they were Premier League quality. And you don't suddenly lose that when you go in the Premier League. I mean, the one he scored that was disallowed, who was it against? Uh, was it against Manchester United? The one that was disallowed. You know, that was a fucking finish. That was a stunning finish. Offside by inches. You know, I think he just offers you a little bit more and a little bit something different than the others. You know, Brennan's got that pace. Um, he's, he's got the ability to take players on. Sam, if he gets in an area, you know, Last season, we saw how dangerous he can be. And as a striker, I used to be a nuisance. I used to be a pest. I used to back into people, stand on the feet. You know, used to go in the channels. I used to show myself for people in, you know, in front of me. You know, I came towards the ball. He does all those things. And I, I just think he can make a difference if he's on the bench and he, he comes off with 20 minutes to go. Mm. Just to make the point as well, I've been known him for as long as I have. He was a pest on and off the pitch. <laughs> <laughs> I'd have expected I'd have expected nothing less than that. So I thank you for that, dear boy. <laughs> um, Greg, we're still waiting to hear how long Johnson's out for. I mean, you don't want to be pessimistic, but if he's out for more than three or two or three weeks or two or three games for the international break, that's a big problem for Forrest, isn't it? Yeah, and for the quality he's got, next man up won't necessarily be it'll all be okay. However, when Gibbs White had a bit of a rough patch, Johnson stepped up, didn't he? And maybe now Gibbs White just behind him, he'll be the one that steps up and feeds the other players, you know, like he has been Johnson. So it'd be an absolute killer if if he wasn't in this squad, but it won't be the difference between now and the end of the season. And it's a slight groin strain, isn't it? So we're going into the international break after this. So it might just it might not be Newcastle, but it might just be Newcastle. I think that's what we've got to look at at the minute. Do you know one thing we need to remember as well? And that is that Steve Cooper has been fantastic this season at reinventing this team when he needs mm -hmm. to. Started off with three at the back, consistent with that for a period of time, didn't work, went to a back four. He's the kind of coach that he's happy to think outside the box. And he'll be racking his brains at the moment now to try and work out, with the players out, how he can best make this Forest team effective. And he works as hard as any manager. I know in the Premier League, he's there all hours, God sends. He's, he's up in his office, he's watching game film, he's trying to look for weaknesses and methods, does it on the training pitch. They're very meticulous in the way that they prepare the team, him and his coaching staff, Alan Tate, Andy Reid, Jamie Robinson, etc. They're meticulous in the way that they do it. And I've got every faith that he will find a way to reinvent the group, to deal with the deficiencies, to get them getting positive results again moving forward. You wouldn't always say that with every manager. Some managers are quite stubborn. I play this way. This is my method. I'm not prepared to change. And it can be a problem. I don't think that's the case with the Forest manager. I think you'll be looking at it now very analytically, in depth, to try and work out what he can do in terms of shape, personnel, all these kind of things, in-game situations, to make that team more effective. And I think that's something that the fans should look to and lean on and have faith in that, that he'll come up with something. They're not just going to carry on doing this and meekly drop into this nightmare scenario that everybody fears. They will find a way at some point to get everything right and make a result or two and, and start to come out the other side. I think, I think, I think what, a lot of it, Fletch, I've, always, I've mentioned, I, I completely agree with you, we couldn't have a better manager at our football club than we've been waiting for a Steve Cooper to come for so many years and he's transformed the whole place we know that and you know I've been lucky enough to be invited down to watch training and when I've watched it this is not any you know bias or anything or you know wanting to back at you know anybody but I've been so impressed with what I've seen from players on the training pitch from the way Steve and his staff go about it on the training pitch it's so meticulous it's so impressive it's so professional 
And there's always a saying sometimes, oh, he looks great on the training pitch. But he can look great on the training pitch. But if you don't take it out onto the pitch on a Saturday afternoon, it ain't great. Yeah. You know, you have to, you know, do well in training and then do well on the Saturday afternoon as well. You can't, I can't praise what I've seen enough. But if a player doesn't do what he does on the training pitch and think about it and learn from it and take it out on the Saturday, then that's the player's fault. You can't blame yeah. them for that. And, and I know all this to be a fact, guys, because my, my son's in the academy, so he's there three nights a week. So he starts training at anywhere from six till 20 past seven. And every time I drive him there and drop him off, Steve's car's in his car, his car park space, the light's on in his office and the little building directly on the right when you go in. So I know that he's there all hours, God sends, trying to work this out. You know, that he's in there, crack of dawn, trains the players. They do what they do and get off. He spends all afternoon and into the evening dealing with everything to try and get this team functioning the way that he wants it to function, the way that the fans want it to function. So it's not through lack of effort. And it's certainly not through lack of putting the hours in and, and meticulously going through to try and find a way to get it right. He's there all the time. And... He's working so hard to try and do it. And I think he's the big reason why they'll win this battle and stay in the Premier League. Yeah, because, I mean, I'll just make a point. If you if you were predicting the results at the weekend, no one would have had Bournemouth to beat Liverpool. So it feels like a season to me where outside of Man City and Arsenal, every team's eminently beatable on the right, you know, get the right day, get the right approach, and it can definitely happen. I was going to ask Greg this question, but he's done his usual disappearing act. So I'll ask you, Fletch. It feels to me like using your boxing in a, a fandom, a forest like a, punk, a, a boxer that's taken a bit of a pounding in the round and needs to get to the bell and then use, in this case, the international break to kind of reset yeah. and get Kuyate back in the team, get Yates back in the team, maybe near Kate. I missed that whole debate, but um, get a bit of a reset going. I think so. And, and I also think as well, that as Gary mentioned, three points in the situation that they're all in makes such a difference to the confidence and to morale. Imagine what the Bournemouth players are feeling like this morning. I mean, got that win against Liverpool. They're going to this week now and think, well, we, we should have got something at Arsenal. We beat Liverpool. They can't wait for the next game to come. You know, Forrest might be looking at it a little bit differently because of the performance they're in. And I certainly think there's enough time. There's 12 games left. I mean, this is not a situation where they're losing matches like this away from home and there's three games to go and if they don't win two, they're going to get relegated. As I said right at the top, a really positive situation they're in. Um, there's a lot of teams below them still who have got to get past them. And they're all asking the same kind of questions that, that we are of their team at the moment. There aren't any team down there, really, that are going, oh, well, we're fine. All of them are nervous. All of them are worried. I think the big difference between Forrest and a lot of them Gary said this early in the podcast. Forest home form, they're scrutiny against anybody. They've had big results against big teams and nobody wants to come to the city ground. And people keep saying, I've got to play better away from home. They've only got to play better away from home if they don't pick up the points at home because they play enough games at home to get enough points to stay in the Premier League comfortably. So it's not all about the away form. The home form is just as important and that's been bulletproof for a long time now. Um, anything positive from Newcastle will be fantastic. But then I also think, too, and Gary can probably tell us this, when, when this is quite mentally draining on a group, all season they've been looking at, can we stay up? Can we stay up? I mean, it can grind you down. And any little break away from it, an international match, one or two will go away, play for their countries. One or two might get a few days away somewhere just to recharge the batteries in the sun. or certainly get a bit of time to spend at home. Psychologically, that can have a real healing effect on a footballer's mind, because they can just switch off. Forget about it a bit. People used to ask why Cluffy used to take these lads away on trips in the season, because they were playing that many games. Every now and again, they needed to forget about it. Concentrate on something else. Freshen your mind. And I think this international break comes at a great time for Forrest, both in terms of the psychology of the group, and it's, it's a chance as well to get those injured lads back on the pitch as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I couldn't agree more about the going away thing. I mean, that, that, that was so important to us, because... You know, we, we, I always say this, I think it was about 130, between 130, 140 games in two seasons, you know, which is a hell of a lot of games. And your body can't cope with all that. You know, it's bound to rebound. I mean, it's, it's rebounding on me now. I've got a problem with my knee, arthritis. I thought I got away with it. But it catches up with you eventually, those sort of, you know, games and the training you do on a regular basis as well. So you do need a break. It's good to go and get that break. 
But I don't think players can do that now because they're that well known. They go away. Everybody wants a part of them. You know, they want to try and, you know, sort of trip them up maybe if they're having a drink somewhere. That's the difficulty, I think, of modern day football. You can't do that as much as, you know, we would have done unless you get a complex where it's private and you can just chill out and relax, which I'm sure there are around the world of fantastic places. But, yeah, I think the, the international breaks are very good. Some players, you know, if, you, if you're winning games, Bournemouth won't want the uh, international break at the moment. You know, Forest, I think it will do us good. But we still haven't been beat, you know, at home, the city ground, since September. That is a staggering achievement in any walk of football. You know, it's, 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 we're, we've been the relegation battle, but we've not been beat at home. And that's what gives everybody hope. It's just disappointing that we can't pick things up a little bit away from home. You know, we just won the one game at Southampton, drew at Bournemouth. Um, you know, it'd it just be nice to pick up something away from home on one of these games coming up. But if we win three games at home, we stay up. Simple as. Well, they're also 14th at the table, by the way. We're having this conversation as though they're adrift at the bottom. And, you know, if they don't win two or three on the bounce, they're going to get relegated. I mean, this is a team that's 14th in the league. And if we'd have picked up one more win through the whole season, then look at the league position then. You'd be going, we're in a great position here. One win you're talking about. We can dissect every performance with a fine tooth comb if that's what we want to do. And a lot of the time, you'll be disappointed because teams in the bottom half don't win every week. So there's always going to be something wrong. I but think if, that's. If you look at the league table, it, it's such a. It's so small. The concern that people have got now from being totally like, we're in a great position, it's so minor. Yet a lot of the discussions after Saturday and after West Ham and Everton make you feel like this team is cut adrift and has nowhere to go. 14th in the Premier League with 12 games left. It's a, it's a, it's a really good position for any newly promoted side to be in. I think people look at Fulham and the season they've had, and then it makes you think, well, why can't that be our club? That happens very rarely. You know, this is a, this is a, a really strong position for a newly promoted team to be in at this stage of the season. And if you take a step back and look at it like that, People will feel a lot more positive about the situation. But if we go 90 minutes by 90 minutes by 90 minutes, you're always going to find things that worry you, scare you, and make you think that this is going to end badly. But they're in a great position now. I think everybody would have taken this. 14 to the 12 games left. I'd, I'd have signed up for that. Yeah, I'd think so. now, you know? That's the one thing I was going to say that my mate Billy, the Brentford fan, always reminds us whenever we pick up a point, if this is our bad run, if this was our bad run that we've just had now, we've picked up two points from it. Those two points have kept us clear from the relegation zone. So it's every single point, no matter where you get it or how you get it, the disappointment and getting a point against Everton, that's the thing that's probably going to keep us up. So just remember, this was our bad run and it still got us ahead of that relegation zone in 14th, potentially 12th Saturday morning. True. True. That's the thing. Let's see how they do against Newcastle. It just swings. I mean, you know, you're at the moment, you play a home game, you're a happy Forest fan. You play an away game, you're a miserable Forest fan. We'll try and get somewhere in the middle, hopefully, and see how it goes. After the you Newcastle know, Matt, if you think about it, they've got 12 games left. If they drew 12 games, they'd stay up. 38 mm. points. They haven't even got to win again to stay up this season. You can draw all 12 matches and 38 <laughs> points this season will keep you in the Premier League. So they don't, they don't ever need to win another match. You can't lose any if they went down that route, but 12 points is more than enough. I think 10 would suffice because I think they're going to be nicking points off each other as it goes with so many teams involved. So, you know, three more wins, and I think regardless, they'll be all right because they're going to pick up something somewhere outside of that. They're not going to win three and lose nine. So that, that's a very reasonable ask for any team, let alone this one with the fan base at home and the, the advantage of the city ground that, that Forest has. True, true. Right. Uh, any last words, Greg, before we go? Anything to plug? Oh, is this AOB? Yeah, yeah I mean, my, we're an uh, hour I spilled, five minutes in, so. spilled a bottle of water halfway through that and it's wet my foot. So. <laughs> oh, bless. <laughs> yeah. Uh, any other business? I'm at Sleaford Mods tomorrow night, one of Nottingham's best ever bands. I think it's sold out, though, so you can't get a ticket anymore. Uh, and my last plug of Celestine's on Saturday. They were one of these bands that during lockdown, they had a, um, 
they had a gig planned April 2020. They were the next big thing around here. And then lockdown happened. It like really did dampen their, their rise in fame. So I'd love to see Bodega sold out on Saturday night because they're such a quality band and it's only like £7 a ticket. So if you're stuck for something to do and you're a little bit hungover after a Forest win on a Friday night, then just get yourself a ticket and get well, down Bodega because they are a quality, quality band. Well, I'm at uh, Southampton Wednesday night and I've got uh, Brentford Leicester on Saturday. So two games that are really important to uh, to Forest. So uh, that should be interesting. And I'm happy anyway. I don't know if you've been watching the players uh, tournament, the golf. I had Scotty Scheffler to win and Victor Hovland each way. <laughs> he, fin he finished third. So I'm a happy boy this morning. You can see you've changed yourself to a new shirt. Guys, with you. <laughs> uh, this is it. I've been out already and got it. 50p yeah. each way it gets it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I'm right, off to see one of your finest triumphs, guys, on Wednesday night. I'll be in the, the Bernabeu with Liverpool, and I always sit there in the commentary position and look to my left where Robbo scored the goal. And whenever I walk to the stadium, I get a tingle down my spine because I think that's our greatest moment as a club. Winning that trophy against that Hamburg team in that stadium will always stand on a pedestal for me. So I'll walk there and I'll think about I had an assist in that one as well. You did. You were very strong. And I, I always think about you guys because I've been fortunate enough that you've all become my friends over the years. And when I walk to the stadium, it's directly in front of you. I get a little bit emotional because I think about what you lot achieved in that stadium and did for us that night. And being a Nottingham lad walking down, it's such a strong connection with that place. And it just, I don't know, it makes me, makes me feel a bit singly, guys. And I'll be an emotional boy walking down there thinking of you on, on Wednesday. And I would just like to say one more thing, any other business. And I really mean this. I think we've got such a wonderful set of supporters. We have such a wonderful feeling around our club. And we have such a wonderful advantage of being at the city ground. On a serious note, anybody who at the minute is taking time to abuse any of the players in any way, shape or form, please stop it. Because they're human beings. It'll hurt them because they care but you're only going to make it more difficult for them to achieve what we all want to achieve, and that is to stay in the Premier League this season. So please stop doing it. Get behind them as much as you can because you're brilliant when you do it. Give them your love, give them your support, give them your positivity, and I'll be amazed if they let you down. I think they'll pull it off. I think we'll stay in the Premier League, and I think we can all go into the summer then and get excited about the players that are going to come in, whether we can take strides next season. You guys are going to play your part. The guys and girls who go down every week and pay their money are going to play their part. Don't, just well, don't get on the players' backs at this stage. Give them your love and support and help them over the line because you're, you're huge. You're a huge part of this journey. Exactly. Just the one, one last thing from me about the, the, the job Steve Cooper's done. We know all the players that have come into this football club, you name me another manager who would have managed it as well as he has with the amount of players. I mean, it was a bit of a standing joke. But, you know, people were saying, oh, how many, how many you signed this time? You know, people of other football clubs. He has managed that situation unbelievably well because it, it, with so many coming in trying to pick your best team trying to get your best 11 and we're like your flex said we're 14th in the league it's not easy and believe me the professionalism of the football club on the training pitch when i've seen it has been incredible and something to be proud of uh, just quickly for me, I promise I'd give a plug to a fanzine um, called Oh Miss Rolling In uh, and there's other great fanzines as well like Trevor Francis tracksuits and stuff like that and people are actually asking for film recommendations in the comments, that's my recommendation last week so I'll say the menu on Disney Plus if you want that, that was good. Right, we've gone way, way over time, I've kept everyone for a really long time. Gary, thank you very much Pleasure. Fletch, thank you very much. Thank you mate. Greg thank you. Friday night under the lights, finish 12th will be great Yes. I, I can't make it. I've got to be in Brentford, haven't I, for the night before yeah. a game. So. Oh, dear. Get oh, those okay. fireworks ready. Yeah, well, Friday night, as this, as Greg says, a win, 12th, puts a very different slant on things. Let's hope that happens. I uh, hope everyone very much enjoyed this. Do like and subscribe. Have a good week, everyone. And we're back later in the week with a Newcastle preview. Otherwise, we shall see you soon. <laughs>